Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As the Dean of CAS Business School, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you here to the Alumni World Forum 2013. This is part of our 10th birthday celebrations for CAS Business School. And if you've seen the plaque in the reception, you'll have noted that it's almost exactly 10 years ago that Her Majesty the Queen opened this magnificent building. Our inaugural World Forum took place three years ago. The idea is to celebrate the depth and talent of our global alumni network. We have over 36,000 alumni in the UK and overseas. Some of them will be following today's events either by being present or through online streaming, interacting with us, and we'll have some questions coming up during the day through Twitter, I hope. The flagship event that you're attending today in London is designed about sharing ideas, networking and debating with world-leading business thinkers through lectures, masterclasses, and then an evening reception. In a way, this is a global gathering and it's a celebration of the fact that truly, truly CAS is an international business school. Over 65% of our students come from outside the UK. We have 3,500 undergraduate, postgraduate and doctoral students coming to us to study business management and finance from, at the last count, over 140 countries. So this really is a global day. We're starting it off in a global city. Thank you all for coming. I have no doubt that the panel sessions will provide us all with thought-provoking debate and insightful comment. And I look forward to meeting you individually at the various points during the day where we'll be coming together for discussions. My job is now to hand over to Sir Malcolm Williamson, who's chairman of the CAS Strategy and Development Board, and he's going to introduce our keynote speaker this morning, Sir Malcolm. Well, thank you, Steve. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and a big welcome. It's been my great pleasure the last five years or so to chair the Strategy and Development Board here at CAS. It, uh, it's a very exciting job, and I get to see a lot of interesting people when I come to lectures here. Uh, no surprise that we've got a very great speaker for you today. Um, it's my real pleasure to introduce Professor Lu Ming Kang. Uh, not only has he had a most distinguished career in China and overseas, but he's also an aluminum of the City Business School, as it was, uh, before it became CAS. He got his MBA there, and he was telling me last night that he's used many of his experiences from that course right through to the present. He's also an honorary doctorate from the university. Amongst his many achievements, he was the chairman and president of the Bank of China between 2000 and 2003. He was the ever, ever bright group chairman, 99 to 2000. <coughs> He was the Deputy Governor of the People's Bank of China in 98-99, where incidentally I first got to meet him when I was the CEO of Standard Chartered Bank at the time of the Hong Kong handover. So uh, it was nice to reminisce a bit last night. From 2003 to 2011, he was the Chairman of the China Banking Regulatory Commission, and he's a member of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China and a member of China National Energy Commission. He's had several, several other appointments of note on the international front, including the Financial Stability Board, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, Bank Nagara Malaysia, and the Daimler Chrysler Group. And in education, he's had several and has several important roles, both in China and in Hong Kong. And he was telling me last night he spends half his weeks in Hong Kong talking at the university. Now the subject of RMB and world power is a fascinating subject and it's been uh, somewhat controversial in the USA and it's become more intriguing recently with the exchange deal that's been done with Australia on minerals. I think to put this whole subject in context, uh, Professor Liu will want to talk a bit about the trend in global <coughs> finance and particularly what is happening in China across the financial sector 
Because without looking at those things, you, you might not have the context in which to have a debate about the RMB and its future. So I look forward very much to a stimulating presentation from Professor Lee, and I look forward to a great panel debate afterwards. Professor, thank you. Thank you, Sir Morgan, for that introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so honored and pleased to come back to see you and to hear the people talking on business issues and the social issues, and to meet my old friends and the new friends as well. And I call it a meeting of uh, minds. That's a meeting of minds. Actually, London for quite a long time has been my home away my home and uh, so it's good to be back. Uh, today I will give you a uh, uh, brief about uh, a perspective on the trend of global finance. Very quickly uh, if you look back and uh, what happened on um, the global, of a recent global financial crisis you will find such a visual circle and on macro side it's very interesting. We can see that uh, it's a tripping dilemma. Uh, in 1960s, we got this such a theory, and that has broadened and uh, effective in 70s. But uh, nowadays, it's even enlarged to the whole global issues, because it's not just the focus on the dollar's positions and uh, the linking with the U.S. budget. And uh, nowadays, anyone who wants to hold a large book in the market and uh, to make their currency as a reserve ones, and you got to see this dilemma over there. And also on micro side, what happened is that there's absolutely something wrong for the incentives and the motivation schemes and uh, that is the structural problems and the huge moral hazard involved. You can see after a few years with the colorful exotic products like uh, CDO and CDO squares and 30 minus 2 or something like that and uh, people are, uh, were thinking about the quick box seekers. They are becoming quick box seekers very quick, uh, quickly and uh, uh, behind the story is the huge poor incentive schemes and the motivation schemes driving for that. In the meantime, even worse, the regulatory bodies and the supervisory bodies worldwide just keep them mouth shut. Uh, I talked to the Fed people in New York and San Francisco both, and I said, why could you allow the reverse mortgage such a sad story happened to hurt aged people. They just gave me a smile. <laughs> they just gave me a smile. Okay. And they, they, because you said the government have a very strong stance to push forward that every household could own his house, one home. And so that's the reason why they shut their mouths. And this is a weakness that could be shown everywhere. In this country, when I was here, I think the supervisory scheme, the regulatory scheme, it was quite sound and healthy. <coughs> they combined with the modern approaches, models, and ITs embedded in the banks and embedded with the Bank of England. And in the meantime, they will never forget, we will never forget the traditional approaches to harness the risks. But nowadays, I don't know, coming from when, then we created some philosophy like light touch. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, by and by, they turned the light touch into the no touch. <laughs> so this is the big problems here and there. And also we found the f problems coming from accounting systems, rating agencies, <coughs> and the malpractice and even more hazard. Uh, hugely embedded in all these organizations. So what happened by the end of the day, they say we can see the 
as a huge leverage embedded in layers and tiers in the products they create and they're sold to the customers. So finally, we found the cross-border contagious loss sharing was so, you know, unrational. And uh, the state and the taxpayers uh, <coughs> paid costly. And also the deposit insurance schemes didn't work in many ways. And the financial consumers interest can never be protected fully. And uh, then IMF IMFs uh, <coughs> stepped in and a lot of other organizations followed. And they, but still, they couldn't give us any good policies and guidance in good time. So unlimited monetary easing could be seen to rescue everything. But uh, when the central banks are keeping up, uh, 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 when the central banks everywhere keep pumping the money to the market, there's only a tiny portion of the money could be channeled to the, those organs which have commercial viable businesses, especially in SMEs areas. So that is a tra tra tragedy we witnessed. And coming back to the structural problems, and uh, what haven't, have, we have witnessed is uh, overconsumption in many countries and overleveraged, uh, attached and uh, embedded with such a uh, gross model. So that is something we got to think twice. <coughs> so the whole world economy today, we can see some new trends. The first thing first, I should say, I'm very sorry to say, after so many years' efforts, the final resolution of the fundamental issues, structural issues, fiscal issues, banking supervisions, and the regulation issues, are still stuck on the way over there in US, EU and the US. And we can see the recovery of the economy is still very sluggish. Um, when I talk to our common friend, Superior Mario, Mario Draghi, and I mentioned that it's very difficult for the Asian countries to think about a solar and a sauna healthy scheme for banking bankruptcy and the resolution <coughs> and the deposit insurance scheme. He told me that the worst story is over here in Europe because among the Euro areas, we have 17 countries. In EU, we have 27 countries and nations. And we have 27 bankruptcy, banking bankruptcy laws and the resolution schemes and the deposit insurance schemes. So it's very difficult when you put something in real. You can say beautiful words when the thing is shy, but you will keep your mouth shut as soon as it's going to rain. So, the, after so many years, uh, keep pumping the money into the market, and we calm down the very sensitive issue, that is, uh, if the EU or Euro areas will be falling apart. But the, the point is, when the quantitative easing is moving on alone, if they could be, couldn't be closely followed, by bank union, so-called bank union, and uh, even more important, followed by closely by the fiscal union, there's no use for such a quantitative easing and the rescue package and uh, innovated by Superior Mario. So <coughs> global financial market is still weak and very volatile, which could be witnessed by recent you know, the shock in the price, fluctuation of the price of gold and many other financial assets. Uh, because the people in the market will be thinking in this way, maybe this time it's different. And we don't know the rules of the game, so we don't play the games anymore. Because, you know, the central bank and to the treasury from the, uh, from the, uh, uh, 
the, some countries will be ordered to sell the gold if you want to get the rescue packages from the ECB and IMF. So this is the first of its time of that kind to get the rescue package. So people will be thinking automatically if people are, our rules of game is changing. Uh, Plus together with many other facts in the market, so people are losing the confidence to keep gold at hand. And this is only one small, tiny piece of information we can get from this one. But anyway, the whole year round, because this is a year of snake in China, so I think the market will be moving on like a snake to certain <laughs> ups and downs. It's still very volatile. The reason why, because we haven't got the better map, map roadmap in many people's minds. And the double-edged quantitative easing led to three things. It's quite horrible. If we see the inflation, people are terrible, terrifying about the inflation because we witness the side effects of the hyperinflation and the stagnations as well. But nowadays, I, I, would, I would share with you my point of view. If you have a sustained low interest rate, it will be also quite terrifying. And the three things are happening. One is a great refreshing. Everybody wants to see the refreshing with their own economy at the cost of sacrificing a lot of things. They'll keep pumping the money to the market and make sure that the inflation will be coming back. And, uh, but countries vary and growth models are different. So if you adopt the same thing, you are adopting one size fits all, which is meaningless. Second is that what we are witnessed today is a great rotation here and there. That means the, the rotation of the risk taste people are taking. Just to give you a figure, uh, for the junk bonds, the worldwide, and to the investment, the stock of the investment, the Warren, is coming very quickly and shortly from 1.3 trillion US dollars and up to today, up to now, is 1.7 trillion US dollars. And people can never stand five years in running for a zero year by purchasing treasury and the zero something interest rate and the yield coming from triple A, even triple A and the double A companies worldwide. So the great rotation will cause a huge stir in the markets here now and in the future. And the third day, newly emerging markets as in particular will be witness uh, a great capital flow, inflow and outflow. The frequency and the margin of the flow will be huge, and uh, which will cause a lot of instability of social and economic life of those countries. So the double-edged sword of quantitative easing, we must uh, take a broad vision. What kind of side effects during the future past, future years, and in the past, could brought uh, could bring us something? And the geographic politics and the unstable factors here and there are uh, still very alarming. But the, the economic suffering especially sustainable suffering in Europe and the US, and the numb people's feeling and awareness on safety. However, these issues are very critical. So uh, in China, I warn the people of such a phenomenon because we have uh, a lot of conflicts happening here and there, and the possible t potential conflicts on disputed uh, territory and uh, islands and the uh, seas and so on and so forth. 
over there, and also anti-money laundry, anti-terror fi anti, uh, financing are still uh, big problems with us. And the priority of international regulatory reform changing from standard setting five years ago, and we started to kick off the Basel III and the modified Basel II, and the four years ago we kicked off the new campaign of solvency II for insurance industry and the reinsurance industry to implementation. But nowadays we can see the global inconsistency in implementation timetable. The timeline frame for to the implementation is so uneven, which surprised me quite a lot. Because everybody is saying, OK, we will do that. But uh, finally, uh, US dropped and saying that we are not ready. And the EU countries said, we well, are not ready either. So it's uneven implementation, not to mention still we have a lot of vacancies in a very important benchmark like liquidity uh, called a net stable funding <coughs> ratio is very controversial today. And in six months, I don't know if they can deliver something about that. And the leverage, I hopefully, I, I, I hopefully we can get that something before the mid of this year. But still a lot of things are very vague, but we are actually racing against new risks. So people will automatically ask themselves, are we ready for the future war? Because everything we have done is to get ready and to sum up the province coming from the past the war, but are we ready for the future wars? The answer is no. So that is something uh, we got to keep our eyes open widely. <coughs> right, and uh, next. Sorry, could, could you help? Okay. Uh, let's talk about uh, um, this year, what happened in China. And uh, China nourished something. Uh, and uh, we are determined to do several things about this. The first thing is uh, further reform. We do need some reform, and especially to combine the political reform <laughs> together with economic reform. And the second, we need a better rule of law. And uh, we need more democracy and to have the people say from the very beginning or during the whole process of decision-making procedures. And uh, we got to have a better business environment to check the people to do the business. Because nowadays, the market is not so good, and uh, the burden is quite heavy, and the funding cost is spiraling up. So we got to better our business environment, attract people to stay on their core businesses to do this. And this to promote the sustainable growth. And what China is aiming for is to nourish a rising and a larger middle class. And hopefully, by year 2020, we could have 500 million middle class. And this is the key important in China, to kill the inequality in the social life. And the provide safe and the better quality products is another key mission. The it's a safer and a quality products plus service is very important to boost the Chinese domestic consumption to realize the structural adjustment. Funny enough, when I teach something in Hong Kong, I witness everywhere there's a long queue 
and coming from um, my mainlanders. And ask them, uh, what are you buying? They said, well, I'm buying everything. They <laughs> said, I buying the milk powder? No. More than that. And what's, what's that? The soy sauce. Soy sauce. The soybean sauce. Okay. They, they, they want everything back to their home because they think the products they could buy in Hong Kong or via Hong Kong uh, are of with better quality and much safer. So that is the big problem. So what China is doing is got to provide safer and better products. Otherwise, the domestic consumption, which can kill the gap left by the less and the fewer exportation is not with us. Support of the growth of SMEs is another topic because SME um, promote the jobs in China, 90%. So support the growth of SMEs and promote domestic and international trade, effective control over capacity, promote energy saving, and create jobs. This is a major thing China is thinking and is doing. And also technology and innovation. Uh, it's already a huge campaign. And it's, uh, we have a lot of star companies like Huawei in Shenzhen and Hale in, in, in manufacturing the home appliances and so on and so forth. And ensure the safety of the supply chain is another topic people are discussed and the debate heatily because, um, you know, in energy side and the agriculture side and the food side, we haven't got adequate coal chain in supply chain to make sure that uh, from the field to farm field to the table, we can offer people something very safe, okay? And um, the reform of the main theme of the year in China in, will be included a dozen of points. I will quickly go through them that stress. Uh, we will put emphasis upon top-down design approach because uh, big country like China, you need a driven leaders so long as they have a right road map. So to enhance the democracy, promote road changes of the government and fight against corruption, all these big issues got to be driven by the top people. And uh, it's a top-down approach. And the fiscal and the tax reform is quite urgent. And the financial sector reform um, I, I don't think uh, I need uh, to say more because to the excellent world class audience sitting here, and uh, uh, it's not necessary for me to mention this. Maybe we can discuss later on in the panel. And we reform the decision making mechanism of capital investment as well, and we reform the pricing mechanism of resources. This is very important in China. If you want to have a fair competition in the market, if you want to let the market play a more important role, and you got to put the pricing right. So pricing mechanism should be correct in China. And the reform the income allocation system, and the reform the healthcare, Medicare, and the pension system. Uh, fortunately, nowadays, the top leaders in China got to awareness that how important our safety net will be. So they got to lock up the bottom line and make sure the people will be at ease to consume. And reform the SOEs, as I mentioned, and the reform the education system to nourish um, the talent, the well, the markets, uh, which the market that they needs and uh, promote the development of non-SOE sectors and to help the foreign joint venture companies or the 100% uh, foreign-owned companies and the private sectors. 
and set up the monitoring evaluation system for environmental protection and supported by tax incentives in emission trade system uh, like uh, UK has and the European has. And uh, real estate sector, we still need policy improvement to make sure that we are doing our homework in the right way. The challenges and opportunities of China, Chinese financial sector, we will quickly run through these points. The pressure upon the growth and the profiting models are five-fold story. What we can witness is fast pace of profit growing in banking, insurance, security firms might be disappearing. And we will say goodbye to that trend. And the NIMS net interest margins might be shrinking. Deposit growth might be slowing down. Interest rate liberalization will be with us with a quickened pace. And the foreign change rate liberalization, I think sooner or later it will be with us as well. And all, all these things, the most important thing is the wake-up call for a better liability and asset liability management of financial institutions. Over competition and the fast changing digital markets, digital markets in China, we have investment, uh, banking, commercial banking, e-commerce and the logistics. It's a, a quite heated competition in those areas and to make sure that they will bring us further changes in governance, in risk control, and in growth model changes. Large exposure risks upon SOEs and the government platforms, funding platforms, systemic risks and the risks arise from the wealth management businesses. Because everybody is doing the wealth management in China nowadays. Not only in the banks, but also the insurance companies, security firms, and uh, all, all, all kinds of funds are very active in doing the wealth management businesses. Um, but we should be heightening our vigilance and make sure that we understand the products we sell and uh, we understand the customers and uh, they are taste of the risks. And the uh, war for talents could be witnessed in whole Asia, not only in China, but nowadays it's quite hot. And um, foreign companies and the domestic companies are hunting for talents. And uh, I don't think our educational system are very, uh, are well functioning in cultivate the necessary working staff to help um, the end users. And what will be the central bank's role and the new regulatory requirements, implications? I think uh, still no answer about this because everybody are following the trend brightly because the central banks uh, nowadays are given two assignments, not only hitting the target of inflation, but also they got to be responsible for financial re stability, even social responsibility. I don't think it's reasonable, and uh, I don't think they are ready to do such a job. Talking about the ridiculous term like counter-cyclicality, I don't know central banks uh, could get rid of such a bad habit that is always behind the curve. Right. So, uh, what is the implications supposed and suggested from Basel and from other organizations remains still a big question mark, and uh, we got to be careful about that. Right. This is a topic, and uh, we will be discussing and uh, uh, status quo. The cross-border use of IMB, just give you some figures quickly. By end of last year, the warring of international trade settled with IMB currency is over 800 billion. 
And um, people are using credit cards to consume, to do the consumptions outside of China. And that figure almost uh, doubled every year. Okay. So cross-border use of IMB is broadened from trade to IMB clearance and uh, clearing with the foreign banks opening IMB account with domestic banks. And we signed a lot of monetary swap agreements, though it's not enough. And to some swap agreements, they are not fully used. There are a lot of shortcomings embedded, and we can talk about in the panel as well. By year 2012, offshore IMB deposits in Hong Kong increased seven times. And the total issuance of the IMB in Hong Kong is over 300 billion. It's increasing with each passing day. The trading volume of the Chinese currency foreign change cross-currency swap, FRM, floating rate arrangements, and options increased rapidly as well. So, uh, let's see the pros and cons of such a move, such a movement. Pros, pros, and uh, we can see number one, the strong point we are doing is to improve the Chinese trade conditions because we have a lot of debates and the controversials and the lawsuits around the trade. And uh, so if you use the local currency and to do put IMB interna internationalization, to certain degrees, it will be ease that tension. And the second, that it minimize the foreign change risk for the Chinese users and investors, uh, because you can temporarily forget the translation risks uh, uh, in, in between. And that also you can lower the financing cost to certain degrees. And also you benefit to the development of the domestic financial market. Because in return, IMB internationalization will automatically bring us fresh blood from international markets to quicken the pace of the reform on our domestic side. Cons. A precondition of IMB internationalization is the liberalization of capital count. In such a case, the interest rate and exchange rate gap between onshore and the offshore market will bring volatile capital inflow and outflow. Subsequently, that will hamper the domestic macro adjustment, independence of monetary policy, and the stability of the IMB value. Uh, uh, the fluctuations of IMB value is uh, nothing terrible, but uh, if it's a huge fluctuation, so, uh, we got to think them twice. A closer link between the domestic and international market requires better management of skills on credit risk, market risk, liquidity risk, legal risk, and the reputational risks not to mention the counterparty risk as well. The institution's capab capability on consolidating the risk management. Nowadays, we couldn't see any financial organization in China are excellent in uh, risk analysis and asset liability management on a consolidated basis or on group-wise you know, basis. So that is a huge mission for them and a very big challenges. And uh, also, uh, all these things need to be improved over time and uh, as quickly as possible. And the money laundry, anti-money laundry, anti-terror uh, financing is something we've got to bear in our mind if you want to do this. And the capital inflow outflow might lead to funding cost changes and the more volatile asset prices at Chinese markets. So which this will endanger the social and economic stability. And also, it will automatically cause for uh, more tolerance 
from the top and from the bottom. OK, so what are the preconditions of such a doing? And what can we learn from experience of other countries? I don't want to name them, but there are a lot of them. Domestic financial sector reform, definitely got, we've got to carry out the reform <clears throat> in a subtle way and in a quickened way. Risk management capabilities of all types of domestic firms, not only banks, but uh, I think uh, if you liberalize your interest rate, I think the life insurance companies will raise a sharp cry because uh, they will witness a very urgent task, very urgent task for them to improve their in-house risk control and better their skills and knowledge and experiences. And also we can see the comprehensive RMB internationalization and the capital counter liberalization should be the last step of the financial sector reform in China and it should be consistent with the development of financial market and the evolving regulatory requirements. We can never put the cart before the horse. So with all this, I will stop here and um, we will listen to the panel for further discussions and uh, welcome questions from our elegant audience. Thank you. Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and uh, very warm uh, welcome uh, again from, uh, from me. I'm Lucio Sarno. I'm a professor of finance here at CAS. And uh, I also serve here as uh, deputy dean and, and head of the finance faculty. Um, so, so the speech from uh, Professor Liu was uh, uh, the perfect uh, sort of uh, stage setting for uh, the panel we are about to, to hold uh, on Remnimi and world power. Let me just provide you some more background on the kind of questions I've asked the, uh, this panel to, to address today. Um, the rise of China to, to become the world's second biggest uh, uh, power um, clearly has put its currency in a, in a, in a uh, um, uh, situation where, for the first time in, in decades, we uh, seriously think that the, uh, there is a threat to the dollar as uh, uh, its, its prime role of international reserve currency. The Rembrandt has the potential to become an international reserve currency, and um, uh, if not on a global basis, uh, certainly at, uh, on, a, on a regional basis. Um, yet the, the advance towards that role, uh, that prominent role in international financial markets, um, clearly is facing a number of challenges, which Professor Liu um, quite, uh, quite elegantly uh, summarized during his speech. Um, in, in, indeed, uh, the Chinese authorities can influence whether and how rapidly this, uh, this move will uh, happen. But this is an international issue, of course, of great uh, sensitivity, uh, not least because the Chinese currency is perhaps not the only candidate. Um, in the past, foreign critics have uh, often attacked the United States for um, profiting from the rewards um, of, of being uh, the, reserve, the reserve currencies of dollars issuer and essentially leaving uh, the losses uh, for the countries that end up holding dollars. Um, with the advent of the euro, there was, for the first time, probably a, a credible challenge to the prominent role of the dollar as a, a reserve currency. Uh, but that uh, is obviously facing some very serious threats at, at the moment, given the eurozone problems. Um, China appears to have decided that at some point in the future, the RMB will also be one of the assets uh, taking up a reserve, low, uh, a reserve role in a, in a volume and at a pace that um, Chinese authorities and, and the world economy will, will decide. But a number of questions remain, and these are the sort of questions we are going to try and address today. Um, what is the likely trajectory of the RMB towards its part as a, uh, an international reserve currency? 
How will that path be influenced by Chinese policymakers, other major economies, and international institutions such as the International Monetary Fund? Uh, what could this mean for the uh, ongoing shifts in uh, uh, world economic power uh, and the process of adjustment of global imbalances? Um, our distinguished panel of experts will address exactly these questions. Um, and uh, let me just very, very briefly introduce you the uh, uh, other three speakers who will join Professor Liu uh, in, on, on, the, on this panel today. Um, Maya Bandari um, is director of Global Macro Strategies Citigroup and leads the team in charge of developing uh, macro teams and producing foreign exchange forecasts. Uh, several years of experiences uh, of experience prior to her role at, in at Citigroup, which she only started in 2011. Uh, she was uh, uh, earlier um, uh, working as head of emerging markets at uh, Lombard Street Research here in London, and prior to that she was in Brussels uh, working for the European Commission. Um, the um, Second speaker uh, sitting here uh, um, on, on my right is uh, Simon Derrick. He's the chief currency strategist for the Bank of New York Mellon. He indeed established the currency strategy team at uh, the Bank of New York Mellon over 10 years ago. And um, uh, prior to that, was working for several years uh, uh, for the European FX sales team, uh, still at Bank of New York. Um, Thomas Stolper uh, is the third uh, speaker um, uh, joining us uh, uh, from an as an investment banker on this panel. Uh, Thomas uh, is a long-term friend and managing director and uh, chief currency strategy for Goldman Sachs. Um, I've uh, known him for many years, uh, meeting at conferences both in, among practitioners and uh, academic community. Um, and uh, uh, he leads a team, resp the team responsible for the currency strategy at Goldman, um, at Goldman Sachs for, for many years. Uh, that team has been rated number one uh, by the European uh, Euromoney foreign exchange polls for the last uh, three years in a row. Um, the way I'm going to set up this panel is I will uh, now hand over to our speakers, um, who will, in a sharp five minutes, tell us their point of view on the questions I've just outlined. Uh, so five minutes each for each of the uh, three speakers, and then we will uh, uh, open up uh, the panel, and uh, I will start from uh, asking uh, Professor Liu to uh, 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 sort of give us his um, uh, uh, position, his views on uh, um, uh, the, the um, uh, uh, on, on the views of the investment bankers who are uh, talking about the Chinese uh, currency and its evolution over time. So, Maya, you are first, yes. please. Maya Bandari. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, and indeed, uh, uh, for the, uh, the invitation today. Uh, now, I think China is certainly uh, very critical in any discussion uh, of the world. I mean, it accounts for 15% uh, of global GDP, and of course, even more uh, in growth terms. Now, if we look at our uh, city's forecast, uh, roughly a third uh, of our GDP forecasts are coming from, from China, both, both for, for, for this year uh, and next. And I think you know, the, the sheer size and, and importance of, uh, of China in the global economy means that what we're discussing today, uh, I think, is, is, is uh, really, really very important. Now, you've, you've raised uh, lots of questions. We're going to have uh, time to, to discuss those in the panel. But I'd like to really make uh, two key points before, uh, before uh, we get into those questions. Uh, the first is specifically uh, on the yuan, uh, and the second is on China more broadly. Now, I would argue that, you know, despite, uh, despite China's sort of economic uh, prowess, if you like, we are quite far uh, from meeting uh, uh, the, the requirements of uh, a world reserve currency. Now, there are typically, uh, you know, three or four uh, requirements uh, for countries to sort of, to, or currencies, rather, uh, to, to fit in that category. Uh, you know, an open capital account, a fully flexible exchange rate. Uh, and indeed, deep and, and liquid uh, financial markets. And of course, you know, macroeconomic stability uh, is, is a key factor uh, uh, in the background. Now, of course, there's no hard and fast rule that dictates in which order uh, these things come in. Uh, you know, arguably, the US has not been uh, the, uh, the most stable economy uh, uh, in the last few years. But if we run through the, the, the key criteria, uh, you know, China's capital account is still uh, very heavily managed. 
Um, its currency is also uh, very heavily managed. Uh, the yuan is, uh, for example, against the dollar, allowed to move in, in a 1% uh, daily band uh, from a fixing that the PBOC sets every day. And while we're discussing, and the Chinese are discussing, widening uh, this band, that's still you know, quite far, if you like, uh, f from, a, from a free or, or even indeed a, a, a dirty float. Um, and, you know, at least onshore, uh, its financial markets, particularly the debt markets, which are key in this discussion, uh, are still uh, not liquid enough. Um, the second, the second uh, uh, um, aspect, if you like, that I think is, is, is quite important in this discussion is, is what we think is, is, is quite a major structural <coughs> shift. Uh, that we're seeing uh, happening uh, in China uh, at the moment, and that's really away from uh, investment and exports uh, towards domestic uh, demand as, as a growth driver. Now, this isn't, I should say, an, uh, just an ideological shift. I think it's supported by sort of more natural uh, reasons, a, a falling uh, um, a return on capital, and indeed uh, changing uh, dynamics uh, uh, of the labor market. Um, I, I suppose you know the the what I just said on the capital uh, side of things is not really surprising. I mean, uh, last year China's investment to GDP ratio uh, reached fifty percent. I mean, it's by far the highest we've seen in any uh, major uh, economy ever. Uh, so, so, so these are uh, very big uh, numbers. And I think this concept of a of a shift in in China's growth drivers throws up some really important and, and interesting uh, implications, both for, for the renminbi and, and indeed uh, uh, for the world uh, at large. Uh, I mean, I think that the near-term implications are, are, are perhaps uh, are more, more negative. I mean, you have a, a negative shock, if you like, uh, certainly to, to some of the Asians that are very tightly linked uh, to China, and indeed for, for, for the really large commodity uh, producers uh, in, in LATAM, uh, for example. And, you know, we have precedents of this sort of transition, uh, you know, Korea in the 90s, uh, Japan in the 70s, uh, and in both cases this, this adjustment uh, came, came through a fall in investment uh, rather than a, a rise in consumption, and I think that is, is, is really quite, quite, quite important. <coughs> uh, but I think that the long-run implications of this uh, are much more positive. Uh, I think uh, you know if if, it, if if achieved, I think it, it certainly removes uh, one of one of the key key risks or one of the key reasons why we ended up in a in a in a in the GFC as it's now known. Uh, you know, we, uh, going back to what Bernanke sort of pointed out, you had this you know a, a savings glut in, in China and indeed Germany, and this was matched by by deficits in in, in Europe and, and most importantly in the U.S. And this really was 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 the key problem. And I think uh, that we're, we're moving forward on that uh, is a very positive uh, development. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maya. Sam. Thank you. Um, the topic at hand is the, the, the remember and world power. <coughs> and if we're going to talk about financial crises and currencies and world power, we've also got to have the, the possibility of conflict. And in currency terms, that means the, the rather hackneyed phrase of currency wars. Um, and it's a... It is a hackneyed phrase, it's an overused phrase, <clears throat> but nevertheless, I think throughout the course of my career in financial markets, uh, the manipulation of currencies by governments uh, for their own particular purposes has been one of the defining themes. Uh, I started in the dealing room in the mid-1980s and pretty well ever since then, uh, there's been people trying to manipulate currencies. I think in the context of the renminbi and the, the story of the last decade, um, perhaps the defining currency war has been the one between the United States, China, and Japan. And to go back, I believe that the genesis of this particular conflict came back in 1999, 2000, and 2001, when the United States complained vocally about China's policy of pegging the renminbi, and also complained very vocally about Japan's continued attempts to uh, verbally talk down the yen and to intervene on occasion as well. That policy in the United States, I believe, changed around about late 2001, early 2002, when the United States decided, in effect, that simply complaining wasn't enough and instead decided to fight fire with fire. And I believe that they adopted highly accommodating monetary policies, not only to support the domestic economy, but to get a rather more competitive dollar. Uh, quite clearly, a policy of benign neglect uh, requires the U.S. to be able to have a, a degree of plausible deniability. 
But I think there were enough comments came out from the likes of Treasury Snow and Treasury Secretary O'Neill in the early stages of their careers to know that that was probably what the United States was doing. Whatever the case, the US certainly managed to get a dollar that was significantly lower. And so when we have currency wars, there's also got to be a winner and a loser. And I'd argue that over the course of the last decade, the United States has been the winner. It has got a currency that is materially cheaper. It has managed to do it without seeing any major spikes in inflation over that period of time. The average level of uh, headline inflation in the US is not materially different over the last decade to what it was over the previous decade. Um, it has managed to get industry, which is actually now competitive on the world stage. And thanks to the miracle of uh, fracking, it may even be able to become energy independent. And it's been able to do all that whilst being able to borrow in vast amounts of money at very, very low rates indeed. On the opposite side of the equation, we have China, which has managed to amass $3.4 trillion worth of uh, other people's debt in its reserves. And it is lending that money at extremely low rates and putting the money into, obviously, debt that has got somewhat questionable ratings. In return, it gets, it gets uh, spikes in inflation every now and then, whenever the United States decides to turn on the monetary taps, and it doesn't have the full set of tools with which to tackle that. And so I do believe that the drive towards dealing with that issue, getting out from under the whole reserve growth story, is central to what happens. I think that if you look within the flow of news over the course of the last uh, five years, six years, it was clear that, that Chinese authorities were becoming concerned about this as, as uh, long ago as 2007. The initial reaction was for the Chinese to increasingly diversify away from the United States and to increase the pace of uh, investment into the Eurozone. But of course, in retrospect, that was jumping out of the frying pan and into the Eurozone fire. And I think it was fairly clear that even in early 2010, there was a change in attitude uh, from officials from what you could hear being said in public. I think the straw that broke the camel's back, though, was the debt ceiling debate in the United States and the downgrade by the, by the uh, S&P of US uh, sovereign debt. Whatever the case, there's absolutely no question that over the course of the last two years, there has been a sharp pickup in debate on the key issues of currency liberalisation, interest rate liberalisation, and most importantly, capital account liberalisation. Um, it may be somewhat skewed towards what the People's Bank and the State Administration of Foreign Exchange uh, may say on this particular topic, rather than the Finance Ministry, but nevertheless, that debate is very public. I think it's probably fair to say that the question is not if capital account liberalisation is going to take place, or even in which order these liberalisations are going to take place, but rather the fine details, particularly on the capital account side. So I do firmly believe that we are moving towards a point where we're going to get liberalisation. And of course, as part of that, there will be the opportunity for foreign central banks to be able to actually invest part of their reserves in China and in the remembering in Chinese debt. I should point out that, of course, technically the renminbi already is a reserve currency. There is the... Uh, the QFII program, which allows uh, countries like Japan to invest small amounts of their reserves. And uh, I've met one or two reserve managers, and I'm sure my, my other panelists have met similar, who have invested very small amounts as well in just straight Chinese deposits. Um, but I do believe we are going to get to that point, not too distant future, where we are going to see China being uh, a fully fledged member of the, uh, the reserve community. I have two questions, though, and maybe. These are two questions that we can flesh out over the course of the next uh, half hour. The first is, is the process that has driven reserve growth globally over the course of the last decade and a bit, uh, does it have that much longer to run? And more importantly, and possibly the key question we have to ask, why would China want the renminbi to be a reserve currency at all? Thomas. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> It's, it's an interesting, uh, this, this question about currencies and power is a very interesting debate because um, uh, currencies have been a policy tool for as long as currency have existed. Um, uh, there, there have been uh, there are descriptions from antique times where countries try to devalue their currency in order to gain um, access uh, to the wealth of other, other trading partners, etc. So this has been an issue that's been around for a long time. 
In that respect, there's nothing really new. What is interesting in, in more modern times is that um, at different stages of the development, there may be advantages of having a very strong currency or relatively weak currency. And so these, these things are evolving. And I think this is, this is particularly interesting at the moment because it looks like China is the transition where it is trying to get away from the, from the, very, from the advantages of a weak currency, maybe more to the advantages of a strong currency. Um, uh, but a lot needs to be done. But let me try to explain this a bit more. Um, the fact that China had uh, a very undervalued currency for a very considerable period of time, and I actually want to go into the valuation debate, um, just pointing out that China is now having 3.5 trillion uh, foreign exchange reserves, and by all means, this suggests that the currency has been relatively cheap, and therefore you have these very large uh, export surpluses. But by keeping this currency so undervalued for such a long time, China managed to um, uh, fast track its, uh, its development. And in particular, the huge amount of foreign direct investment that flew into the country was probably the single biggest boost for the, for the Chinese economy. And it's actually not necessarily the jobs that came with the new, with the FDI, it was the technology. Because every new factory that was being built in, in China this relocation uh, from the US, from Europe, from, from Japan, each time came with the latest technology. So we, have, we had to develop in China the phenomenon of churning, where people were trained in the factory and then went up to the next factory because they were getting, getting a higher, higher job. That's nothing else than the West, Western countries, the more developed countries, training the Chinese workforce into, into latest technologies. So China had a huge advantage of keeping the currency undervalued. But after a while, the technology has come, and we know China is now leading in some technology areas. Um, uh, uh, I've heard flat screen technology. There are clusters in China which, which you don't have anywhere else in the world to produce, produce this cutting edge uh, technology. China has moved up substantially in, uh, in, um, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the technology chain. And now the 3.5 trillion of foreign exchange reserves start to burn a bit. Because what do you do with that? This is a national saving, right? In reality, what this was, it was a transfer from, um, uh, from the future generation, who is ultimately holder of these savings. Central bank reserves are national savings. This is a transfer from future generations to the current exporting, uh, exporting businesses, if you want to, because they get this advantage of having the undervalued currency. That makes sense as long as you track all this, all this technology. But the moment where the technology is there, the future generation is asking, what are we doing with 3.5 trillion foreign exchange reserves? What are we getting in exchange for that, apart from funding an unsustainable uh, um, US growth model, which is, uh, which is um, what we have heard about uh, already earlier this morning? Um, and I think that's the transition in which China is at the moment. So in order to uh, and and, and, and to, to follow the, at the other extreme, when you go right to the end of this transition from like an undervalued currency to a much overvalued currencies, you actually end up with what the U.S. is achieving, meaning you can maintain a living standard well above your means as long as foreigners invest into your currency. So you have the standard advantage of being a reserve currency issuer. So China is along this road, but a lot of need, a lot needs to be changed at the moment. I, from from where we see it stand, is that. The, the, the currency liberalization, the capital account liberalization, which will be necessary to get into a proper reserve currency, uh, I agree with Derek on this, is far, far off still. I mean, um, the amount of, uh, the ability of use RMB offshore, the ability of, of, if you want to go to a bank and want to buy dollars, you can have as many as you want. The America is actually happy for you. Try to get a large amount of your savings parked into RMB. It's incredibly yeah. difficult. There's uh, regulations after regulations, little programs after little programs, this country is de facto still very much closed. There are a lot of tools out there, you just can't get them because as soon as, soon as you want to get into something, into, into a serious investment in China, you hit some form of uh, barrier in terms of investment, regulation, restrictions. But I think this is a reflection of the fact that China is still in this transition and not quite sure where it wants to go, whether it wants to go all the way. The implications of the move towards the reserve currency means that the, CN, that the RMB would be substantially stronger than it is today. The moment people try to allocate reserves into, into China, uh, it, would be, uh, it would need very, very uh, aggressive demand. Just to give you an idea, there are about 11 trillion of foreign exchange reserves in the world at the moment. Um, of those, China has three and a half, so the remaining 
seven and a half um, trillion foreign exchange reserves. Of, the, of those, nothing is invested in the RMB. Now, let's assume, just very conservative, the 10% of the foreign exchange reserves in the world are being converted into RMB. 750 uh, billion of inflows. That is about that is about three times the amount of RMB held at the moment offshore. So we are having somewhere between 200, 300 billion of foreign exchange, of RMB held outside the country. So this is just the central banks. If the central banks wanted to hold this amount, the flows are substantial. We are, we are at a very early stage in this. But I think the realization that China has moved up on a technology scale. It needs to evolve in the model, may want to get a benefit some of the advantage of this of reserve currency is, is precisely the debate uh, where, where China stands. It will take a while still um, until, until this transition is, is, is fully there. Thank you, Thomas. Um, so I, I'd be interested in Professor Liu's reaction to some of the points uh, made here. Uh, I'll just pick a couple of uh, the points that uh, uh, caught my attention. Uh, there was a statement earlier on that in the currency war arena, uh, the U.S. has come out as a winner in terms of macro performance in, in, in various sense. I, I, I wonder whether you felt that was appropriate as a statement. Um, yeah, we, uh, uh, I think it, uh, it's a vivid recollection in late 90s uh, when I was the first deputy governor of the central bank. Uh, we were cultivated and taught by Americans, the, the advantages of the globalization. Mm -hmm. Saying China got to open your door and trade more with us mm -hmm. and welcome the investment, okay? And welcome the factories from the US and made in China, that would be a good thing. Mm -hmm. So we follow that practice and what we witness today is that we produce the more Colgate toothpaste <laughs> yeah, than any other country in the world. <laughs> then we found the troubles coming from the US. The sharp recruiters us, you caused the imbalance of the trade, you caused the imbalance of everything. <laughs> I said, that's what you taught us. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's part of life, okay? So finally I draw the conclusion and do what they do, and they never do what they say. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so, uh, I think they are, and uh, they have been the winner through the globalization, because for such a quite long time, why the inflation is so low in US, because they are the beneficial the biggest one, the worldwide, to receive the commodities coming from in newly emerging markets with lower labor cost, lower land cost, and to reallocation resources more effectively and efficiently globalized. I don't think it, China should be a scapegoat, you know. And this is the deep root cause coming from their own, okay? When you enjoy so-called moderation times, how could you forget where is the resources or all these benefits coming from? And then you losing your tide, you losing your vigilance and to let all these things go. And you know, that is something is typically wrong. And uh, I think uh, we Chinese hold more US dollars as a reserve currency and a foreign chain reserve. And we buy treasury. We never sell them in big smell, a big scale. And uh, even during the disasters, the uh, destruction times when they said we got to kill the moral hazard let the Lehman Brothers broke. And the foreign day they said, no, no, let's change our minds. We got rescued the AIG. Okay. Although there is all this ups and downs and twists and uh, twice and turns, we still maintain the US currencies and reserves uh, all with us because we do not want to trick off another round of panic. 
And uh, when our neighbors are following each other, uh, to catching up uh, the panic uh, visual circle to depreciate their currencies, we still maintain a certain degree of appreciation of the RMB currency. Because in long run, I totally agree with you that for China, still we have a very brilliant outlook because we have 1.3 billion people. It's our homework to get things fixed domestically, to reduce the exportation and the balance, rebalance ourselves, and to protect the nature and to balance the nature and to, to boost our domestic consumption. Why did the domestic consumption was not so, you know, resilient because the shortcomings in our supply chain, uh, safety standards controlling, and the supervisions and so on and so forth. Chinese are always humble and modest in pinpoint to their own shortcomings. We never pinpoint to someone else. Though the spillover effects of financial crisis caused everyone of us, including UK, a huge trouble. So, I agree with that there's no reason to say that this is a sheer currency war and uh, China and the newly emerging markets like China could be uh, scapegoats during such a movement of globalization. We should cultivate everybody in this world Globalization is still something very good. And uh, if you have something wrong, just like Mark Twain once said, if you have one enemy, it is us. Okay? You got to find out your domestic problems and the pinpoint to that ones and cope up with the problems embedded in your country. Mm -hmm and uh, instead of always uh, pinpoint your fingers upon others. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I, I, I was, you know, another question which I think everybody talked about, um, and um, uh, so, so, so you've all talked about capital account liberalization as the necessary preliminary step, of course, before moving towards internationalization of the currency. And one of the, um, one of the lessons we've learned from past crises in Asia and other parts of the world is that that's, that's something we don't, we don't understand very well, really. I mean, the advice, Americans taught a lot of things to the Chinese and the Chinese became masters doing okay and and certainly free trade was one thing they clearly knew became masters of um, and uh, key ingredients in the success of China has been the weak renminbi if you want weak according to some uh, estimates of fair value but now if think about capital account liberalization as opposed to trade liberalization and the benefits that come fr from it um, the stage at which many crises have happened before has been exactly that right uh, East Asia in the late 90s was a wonderful story of emerging markets which did extremely well on the export side, uh, but the moment they liberalized capital accounts and didn't have the infrastructure to intermediate the capital inflow that was coming in, that was the beginning of the end. Um, how do you think China ought to go about capital account liberalization? What's the right, since there is no good example in history, I would say, um, to follow, at least in recent history, what, what, what do you think are the key ingredients to, to, to embark on the path towards liberalizing Chinese capital account without falling into the traps that led to the crisis in East Asia in the late 90s? Um, if I knew the answer, I clearly would have uh, <laughs> gone and joined the Chinese uh, uh, finance ministry a long time ago. Um, I think that, that there is this debate is actually exactly where the, where the debate is right now. It is a, it, the, the, the signals that, that I certainly hear seem to suggest that the debate is how you go about the process of the capital account liberalization. And the example you used of the 1997-1998 Asian crisis is exactly where the concerns currently lie. And so it is about trying to find 
some kind of offsetting inflows that would be there to act as a balance should you suddenly experience severe outflows coming from the domestic markets. And, uh, and the, the, the two areas that I, I do hear a little bit about is um, uh, the question of whether offshore renminbi could be used, could be allowed to invest off onshore. But I think far more importantly is actually, to come back to the topic earlier, uh, actually opening up the space for foreign central banks to be able to push money into China, vastly increasing the QFII from the, uh, the frankly incredibly modest 80 billion it's currently at to actually allow central banks to put money in, in reasonable size. Um, clearly, China would desperately hope that it wasn't going to be 10% of global reserves, um, even if it was half a percent. It would be more than adequate. But simply opening up, increasing the space for central banks to be able to invest, and I think the, by, by the QFII, would be a perfectly sensible way of helping that balance. Any other views? There's, the, there's a problem at the moment, obviously. Um, <clears throat> opening up a capital account in a fast-growing country in a world which is driven by extremely accommodative monetary policy is, is creating a lot of Issues. And it's probably the issue at the margin would be much larger than in the 90s because the, the monetary <coughs> policy regime we are in at the moment is, is even more extreme. So, in that respect, um, uh, the, and the, the whole debate about currency war is effectively about controlling capital flows. But I'm wondering whether the debate is not actually going the other way around. So, obviously, from an economic theoretical point of view, you always argue capital account opening up helps with the efficient allocation of capital, except at the moment capital is plenty, um, at least in, mon in the monetary uh, monetary sense. Mm -hmm. Maybe what helps China at the moment is that the margin of the rest of the world is moving in the direction of where China already is, because most of the countries are actually imposing more capital account restriction at the moment and more fine-tuning. Mm -hmm. Many, many countries use more, act uh, more actively uh, these tools. And it, to some extent, it feels to us that we are moving more into a global managed exchange rate regime, where effectively more and more countries are keeping their currencies in relatively tight ranges, make very explicit policy comments about whether the currency is too strong or weak. And that, that includes all those countries which have historically been um, preachers of uh, open markets, including the, the Bank of England, for example, who has been much more explicit in guiding world ones serving in, in, in recent months. So we might be, maybe, maybe the debate about capital account opening is actually not the one that's relevant for the next 10, 15 years anyway, because it's more the question of like how coordination on a global scale mm -hmm. can be achieved with various forms of keeping the capital accounts actually closed or actually increasing them increasingly closing them, and that's something that touches even the developed countries. So, um, yeah. do, you, do you believe we're going back to a world, say, pre-1995, of far more heavily managed developed world currencies? I mean, not. It, it's, not, it's not impossible. I mean, it's not impossible. If you think the fact about the fact that, that a lot of central banks have been increasing uh, their gold purchases, which is which is almost a natural way back towards some form of new anchor. Now, it's probably not going to work in that way, but, but the idea of doing more co coordination, I think that's absolutely possible. I mean, it's, it's a more, the way we frame this is more like a, a non-cooperative mm -hmm. exchange rate regime because everybody is v getting very active when their own currency gets stronger, and then otherwise, not, not, it's not like the, the people sit down around the table and say, oh, no, this is the currency regime that we want to have, and here we are. We might get there at some yeah. stage, but for the time being, it's more like everybody says, oh, I hope the others don't push too hard because then my currency is getting strong, and if it is really strong, then I have to act as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Look at Japan yeah. recently. But of course, that's a speculator's charter as well. Yeah, so always. I think another really right. interesting sort of d uh, point in all of this is, is war even the right word? Because when you're, when, you're, when you're trying to intervene to stop your currency strengthening, mm -hmm. what we've observed particularly in emerging markets is central banks have actually provided certainly asset markets with important self-reinforcing liquidity. So it's actually been uh, in, in some ways a, a, a positive thing, uh, certainly when you get to, to what happened to asset markets rather than a negative one. So I'm not sure that war yeah. is, uh, no, is, is we will all use it. <laughs> yes, uh, I think, yes, uh, nowadays it's, it's quite a chaos in, in talking about the currency situations. Because after 40 year plus years, you know, we, we got to think about some new mechanism uh, worldwide 
uh, which can bring us uh, more sustainable, you know, the the uh, 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 environment. But uh, so far, we haven't got any better choice. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we can see is that uh, um, in IMF meetings and in Basel or something, we have a lot of discussions among the mm -hmm. central bankers. And uh, um, the good point is that uh, we have free air views and a lot of suggestions mm -hmm. are on the table, like uh, how we can use a lot of vehicles are possible we can use. Uh, uh, you know, special joint rights or something like that, or putting the IMB in India currencies into the basket. There, we could think mm -hmm. about that. That is advantages because this is a democracy. <laughs> this is a democratic uh, picture, vividly. But uh, uh, like Chinese saying goes, "Many men, many hands." Then, <laughs> uh, uh, But um, uh, on the flip side. Uh, coin is that, as the English saying goes, many men, many minds, okay? <laughs> so by the end of the day, you always get nowhere. <laughs> uh, that's, that's realistic. That's part of today's life. So uh, once it's going to run, people automatically draw their cards close much to their chest, okay? That's the uh, automatic things. So, what I think is that, um, um, in ch for Chinese story, China determined to do a bit for the whole world by liberalization, the capital count gradually, mm -hmm. and uh, to talk about uh, liberalization of interest rate at first, mm -hmm. to leave the loom for the foreign investors in the future, if they want to keep the RMB as a currency, as a reserve or financial settlement, a trade settlement, or investment clearing, or something like, like that, they could hedge their risks to certain degrees. So liberalization of interest rate is very important. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you can never give the pricing to the market like uh, three months, six months swap, and the forward rate. So um, to China, I think there's no reason why China should let the be as a reserve currency. We have, haven't got any such intention. Um, uh, when I talked to the vice governor of the PBOC, Yi Gang, uh, recently, he said uh, uh, central bankers in, in, in China have never have got such attention, never ever such attention, let Chinese currency as other people's reserve currency. It's up to their decision. Uh, the purpose of why we put IMB offshore is that we have offshore trade and uh, a lot of investment on both ways, inwards and outwards. And uh, nowadays we, we do encourage uh, qualified investors and, uh, who are armed with the necessary knowledge of the rules and the laws of the destination to go abroad. So that's the reason we want to put IMB offshore on trying basis. Uh, if they want to pick up the IMB as an investment vehicle or clearing currency or settlement currency of their trade, it's up to them. But we never think about IMB will uh, becoming a uh, reserve currency of other countries. It's up to the other central bank's decision making. And, uh, but actually, as far as I'm concerned, a lot of countries are picking up the IMB as part of the reserves. Mm -hmm. It's up to them. But, but to China, if we want to be responsible for such a movement, we got to take several actions. So that's the reason why I firmly suggested the Central Bank and the Ministry of Finance and other ministries concerned in China to take serious consideration of several things. One is that um, because you've got to quicken the financial, uh, domestic financial sector reform, and uh, you've got to deepen the, mar the markets, not only the size of the market, you should be pride of. And uh, you must make sure that the several ministries concerned got to hand in hand 
to produce the yield curve smoothly, riskless yield curve smoothly to the market. And uh, we have a lot of work to do like this. And to do that, you've got to make sure that the market, uh, uh, especially the debt market, will be developing in a healthy way. The, this is uh, something uh, is about market reform. Second thing, to attend this aim, China got to change our mindset to make sure that there's a fair play in the market. Uh, so it's an equal footing for any investors, domestic and foreign, to play the games uh, in the market. So fair play is very important, fair competition. And thirdly, uh, to attend this aim, China got to enhance the property rights protection. Mm -hmm. Okay? And the onshore and the offshore, uh, including the IPR, international property rights, because technology is very important. And uh, if you want to do something better in China, you upgrade your industries and the realignment your existing works of life. And uh, innovation is very important. So the property rights, including IPR protection, is a very important thing. Last but not least is the regulatory requirements got to be clear cut and transparent enough and make sure that you can cope up with the changes moving forward. And uh, that is something. Uh, and uh, a lot of people show a strong concern that, including the emerging markets, our brother countries in Asia, in Latin America, they fear for, as I mentioned, the three things. The last one is a great capital flows. Because with the quantity of easing like that, it's a QE2 or QE3, nowadays it's QE forever. It seems to me, so uh, how to deal with this? I, I, I said it's not necessary to uh, stop here, but instead we can use the topping, topping tax like fees or mm -hmm. something like that so long as we can make sure that we set up a reasonable uh, trigger point to move in, mm -hmm. to in using by using topping tax like levies or tax. And the second, you must mention when and at which conditions we got to exit. Mm -hmm. And the thirdly, if you want to use that scheme, that scheme is a temporary approach to protect their social instability, not protect any other purposes. And in such a doing, you got to make sure a backdrop as transparent enough and to let everybody to understand that. So by such a doing, I don't think uh, we, we, we can feel something. And we Chinese people, we're firmly moving forward towards that and to do a bit in the future. We don't know, uh, you know, the, the final options of the international currency reform scheme, but anyways, anyway, we want to do a bit for us and for the whole world. Uh, if I can conclude my comments by using an English saying, that is, you can still drink from a chipped cup. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I'd, I'd like to collect some questions from, uh, from, from the audience at this stage. We probably have time for two or three at most. So please, uh, if you could just say very briefly who you are and try to be as brief as you can on your question. Thank you. Uh, Roger Curry from CLS Banks. Um, my question is, what do you believe the role of the Chinese Communist Party in Who would you like to answer the question? Anybody in particular? Or? Everybody in the Sure. <laughs> Anybody wants to have a go? I, I, I honestly don't have any deep thoughts on that particular topic. Um, as far as reserve, becoming a reserve currency, I, I, I think it's got to be about actually onshore investment. So. Yeah. Question of volumes. It's not enough access to, to RMB um, for foreigners. There's 
um, uh, in the end, every every offshore holdings of RMB is still, uh, or any offshore investor who wants to invest in RMB is subject to some form of uh, of um, uh, authorizations, limitations, um, quotas. And if you look at the overall volumes, that's the main issue. I mean, people would love to buy more and invest more heavily. Uh, but in general, you always find some form of barrier which which, which limits uh, limits the ability to invest in, in the businesses. Arguably, the second factor is and that that um, uh, links to what Lee said. Um, the development of fixed income markets is probably not uh, sufficient yet. As reserve currency, um, central banks have a bias to invest in fixed income securities, and the fixed income market. In, um, in China is probably not deep and liquid enough yet um, uh, in terms of government security. But it's getting there. There's a lot of development in this area, but there's probably an area that... Uh, but the primary problem is more like the access to the country and, and the quotas. The gentleman in the second row, please. Yeah. Oh, sorry, b before we do that, yes, one just, uh, just one her, second, just one second, one final comment. To her question, quickly, get shared that if any limitations I think that is linking with the three things, that one thing is transparency of information available from China. Okay. Second is that uh, you got to deepen the market. So secondary market activity is very important to increase the liquidity and uh, to increase the room to maneuver. And the third is that infrastructure uh, the infrastructure is the homework of China and uh, with the joint efforts with other partners uh, because we've got to have the system of clearing the settlement linking with SWIFT and to uh, use the CIS approaches like a net position settlement to guard against the risks of the counterparty risks and so on and so forth. All these infrastructure is very, very important to support uh, reserve currency the worldwide. All right. Uh, hi. Thank you so Please. much for your brilliant insights. Uh, I'm, uh, my name is Kevin. I, I, I'm a financial journalist coming from Beijing. And I have two questions for Professor Leo. One is about the corporate bond market uh, scandal nowadays in China. So as the former chairman of the CBRC, how do you think the regulatory body in China should, could proceed the reform in the future to avoid the moral hazard or the insider control? This is my first question. And my second question is about the banking sector's supporting role to the SMEs. So nowadays, the Alibaba is providing very di diversified support to the SMEs. So how do you think the state-owned banks in China could provide more diversified and more, su more su supportive service to the SMEs in China? Thank you. Uh, simply put, for your first question, simply put, a long firewall is the best cure in supervisor's book. Follow me? Yes. Okay. The second question, Alibaba's ch challenges, okay? As ultimately all the traditional banking and the insurance companies will be facing the challenges coming from the markets, okay? It's good in the long run because you've got to think about how you satisfy your customers' <coughs> needs in today's e-commerce world, right? But uh, by the end of the day, you got to think about the balance the way. E-banking and e-commerce <coughs> like this can never replace the traditional banking businesses. Banking is something like art. It's not just a simple model, okay? If you want to train the credit officers, qualified ones, you got to nourish the credit culture. You got to know your customers, not only the customers, but you got to know the customers' business, and you got to know the customers' business risks. It's not easy to get that information through the transactions, share it from the network. So that's my conclusion. Please, gentlemen, ladies in first row, then the lady in the third row, and we will close at that point. Please be brief. Um, hi, my name is Joyce Thu. I'm from Financial Times and China Confidential. So there's the question for Professor Liu um, on shadow banking. 
So um, you mentioned about uh, supporting SMEs in China. Would you think um, shadow banks like private lendings have been playing a healthy role in, in certain sense to support these SMEs? And also whether, in general, this might not be too bad a thing for the Chinese financial market, it's specifically for the um, free interest rates. Do you think, what do you think on that? Thank you. Yeah, uh, shadow banking is a big topic, and uh, we have a lot of discussions uh, about the definition of shadow banking. I don't want to repeat that. Uh, still coming back to my uh, point, so long as we have a firewall between traditional deposit-taking institutions and those shadow banking institutions, that's okay. Okay? So still, the firewall is best secure. It's a novel book. So you must make sure that they won't give the money to the shadow banking institutions in the table. Okay? So that is something we got to keep along. Uh, there's uh, some uh, risk, uh, non insensitive indicator like uh, l leverage issues. And uh, if you think about the denominator of a bank, uh, anything offshore, off balance sheet, should be fully considered and should be used a very conservative CCF to convert them back to the denominator if you calculate the leverage ratio. And the leverage ratio got to be combined closely with the capital adequacy ratio if you supervise the deposit-taking institutions like banking itself. So long as you can do that in the perfect way, and it is the duty of the supervisors, then we shouldn't worry about the shadow banking activities. And to, to certain degrees, shadow banking can use that as a supplementary effort to support the, the small and uh, SMEs. Having said that, I didn't mean that we don't need and lose and lose the guard against money laundries and uh, you know, to use other illegal approaches to get the money back for the shadow banking institution, like blackmails and uh, coerce or something like that. OK, very briefly, please. OK, hello. This is Lindsay, come from Bank of China, UK, <coughs> uh, Limited, and uh, Customer Alumina. I've got a question regarding to the RMB itself. Uh, it's regarding to the RMB direct transfers in between European Union and also to Americans. And uh, as we notice, it is a quite big potential market, but it's not um, quite maturely cultivated as the um, mainland and the Hong Kong market, but that's still a very big market. I, uh, I don't know, is there any uh, other banks, um, colleagues came here, but at least so far as I know, for us, there's um, not a quite clear policies come from the governing bodies to allow, to, uh, allow us doing these transfers directly in between Euro e European unions. So um, my question is just asking, is there any future planning or they like the blueprint for the governing bodies? Um, got the planning like this to cultivate this market. Um, thank you. And uh, second question. Uh, this question well, is to Miss Lee. I think I think one oh, yeah. one it is. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. yeah. Th thank you. So who would like to take the? I appreciate question. your questions, yeah. but uh, that question would be better to be direct addressed to the central banker. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no longer a regulator. <laughs> <laughs> Being a regulator is the greatest. Except the assembling such a poor things. You, you, you can talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> well, at, at that point, I um, would like to take this, uh, I need to take this uh, session to a close, uh, I'm afraid, because I've already gone um, uh, astray with the time I was allowed. Um, I'd like to thank once more um, our, our uh, um, panel discussant, Professor Liu, Thomas Tolper, Maya Bandari, and Simon Derrick for a, a very insightful discussion on the Remnimbi, and uh, thank all of you for being here and uh, your, your contribution. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.